Savior Jesus Christ, we want to welcome all of you to worship with us here at Lewinsville Presbyterian Church on this Reformation Sunday, October the 30th, 2022. We are delighted to have all of you here. We were privileged to be drawn into worship by our bagpipes outside today, so we thank Matt Coldell for um, providing that for us. Friends, we are also privileged um, today to have as our guest preacher on this Reformation Sunday, the Reverend Dr. Margaret Grund Kibben. Margaret is a PCUSA minister and is the chaplain of the United States House of Representatives. She is a rear admiral in the chaplain corps of the United States Navy and, and, and says that she is welcome to call her Dr. Kibben, Margaret, Dr. Kibben. We are honored to have you with us and we thank you for your service and your ministry in the house and for your presence with us uh, today in worship. A number of us were able to be with her for an adult education Sunday school class earlier today reflecting on our vocation as reformed Christians seeking to be faithful to Jesus Christ um, in our lives and in the public square. Um, along with Margaret we want to welcome her daughter Lindsay and her neighbor Mary Alice um, with us to worship as well. Really glad to have you you all here as well. Friends, around the sanctuary uh, today, you will see a number of banners um, hanging um, around the room. These banners um, have been designed to correspond with the different confessions and affirmations of faith that are in our Presbyterian Church Book of Confessions. As you may well know, the confessions of faith in our book of confessions come from different historical periods in the long life of the church. Um, we're going to have them up for a couple of more weeks. And so at some point in the next couple of weeks, I would really encourage you to just take some time to walk around. There's some descriptive materials about each of those banners um, and to remind yourself of the stream of the historical church in which we are taking our place um, here as Christians in 2022. We stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us seeking to be faithful to Christ in their day making mistakes in their day, doing remarkably faithful things in their day, just as we are doing so in our own. Um, this morning, I also want to take a brief moment of personal privilege to welcome my in-laws, Charlie and Nancy Cunningham, who are waving their hands. Charlie and Nancy are visiting us uh, from Pinehurst, North Carolina, and the reason that we are getting them at Lewinsville today instead of with my wife Laura, a pastor at Western Presbyterian Church, is because of the Marine Corps Marathon, which is making it pretty hard to get into the district uh, this morning. So Charlie and Nancy, thank you all uh, for being with us here at Lewinsville today. Friends, we are so glad to have all of you joining us in the room, online at Lewinsville org or on YouTube. If this is your first time joining us here at Lewinsville, we're particularly honored to have you with us um, today, and we hope that today's service will be a blessing to you in your faith journey. Friends, wherever you have come from and wherever you are right now on your faith journey, you are welcome here at Lewinsville Presbyterian. As we listen to the bagpipe prelude now, I would invite you to meditate upon the text that is at the top of the bulletin from Psalm 46, verse 1, um, written for people who were living through turbulent days of theirs as we live through turbulent days of our own. Our God is a refuge and a very present help in trouble. Let us now worship God.
Friends, please stand as you're able and join me in the responsive call to worship printed in your programs. Our call to worship today is drawn from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Let us worship God. It is often said that Presbyterians should not be among those who are shocked when people do terrible things. 
That is because we Presbyterians have a highly developed doctrine of sin. We are deeply aware of our human propensity to act selfishly, to act out of fear, to act out of greed, and to live in ways that are contrary to the will and the purposes and the grace of God. We understand this about others, and we understand it about ourselves. We are broken and sinful people, and the evidence of this is all around us. The evidence of this is in the systems of the world. The evidence of this is in the quality of our relationships and in the character of our lives. We need God's help, as they say, in a big way. The good news is that Christ came not for those who had made themselves righteous, but that Christ came for sinners like us. Friends, let us now turn to God, first in silence, and then together with our unison prayer, and confess to God the sin of our lives. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray together. God of our mothers and fathers, down through the generations, you have raised up adults, youth, and children, people of all ages, to lead and to reform the church. We confess that we continually lose our way, and we need new reformation by your spirit today. We are too often content with cheap religion that asks nothing from us. We cultivate an easy indifference towards the pain and the hurt of the world. Lord, let your living word shake us up and let your Holy Spirit renew us so that we may repent of our sins, live with deeper trust in you, and face the challenges of our day with greater love, courage, and joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. cannot make ourselves righteous. Sin is too much with us, too much a part of our lives, too powerful a force in the world and in our own lives. We cannot make ourselves righteous. That's the bad news. The good news is that we do not have to because God has made us righteous. In Jesus Christ, God has given us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We have been grafted onto him. We have been made one with him. Our sin has been forgiven and washed clean. Our old lives of sin and fear, they have died with him in his death, and we have been raised to new life in him, new lives of faith, new lives of courage, new lives of joy. Friends, believe the good news that comes to you and to me from God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. As we stand. Friends of Jesus Christ, as we are regularly made aware, 
we live in a world of violence, fear, war, and hatred. God's kingdom of peace has not yet been fully established. But God's kingdom of peace has already begun. In the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's kingdom has been inaugurated. And by the Holy Spirit, you and I can participate in the peace of that kingdom today through our faith in him. We do that, and we begin to manifest a different quality of life in the world. Friends, let us now bless one another with the peace of Jesus Christ. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Good morning. If I could invite all the children to come up for the children's meditation at this time, come on up the stairs. I know you're not normally used to seeing me up here for children's meditation, but it's okay. It's, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, come on up. Yeah, hi. All right. So, hi, come on up. Who knows, I think you're going to answer this question like right away. Who knows what tomorrow is? Yeah, how, you can call out. Yeah, call out. It's all good. Halloween, yes, candy, exciting, fun times, costumes. Um, I'll be uh, dressed up as a tired choir director. Um, so that'll be my costume for tomorrow. Um, anyway, but after Halloween, there's another holiday in uh, November. Who can tell me what that holiday is? Yeah. Thanksgiving, right? So... We are thankful for the things that we have. Uh, we're thankful that we have a roof over our heads, families that love us, friends. Um, but we can also be thankful to God, right? So that's why we're going to learn a little song today called For Thy Gracious Blessings. And the congregation. Praises. We can handle this. I get a pitch. Okay? Um, all right, so it goes like this. So I'll sing a phrase, and then you be my echo. For thy gracious blessings, for thy gracious blessings, we give thanks, O oh Lord, we give thanks, O oh Lord, for thy loving kindness, for thy loving kindness, we give thanks, O oh Lord, we give thanks, O oh Lord. I'm going to try the whole thing by myself thing everyone else okay for thy gracious blessings we give thanks O oh lord for thy loving kindness we give thanks O oh lord Just ready? Okay. for thy gracious blessings we give thanks O oh lord for thy loving kindness we give thanks O oh lord Wonderful. And I know that Thanksgiving is kind of far away, but during the month of November, which is coming up real soon, maybe think about some of the things that you're thankful for. Okay? Great. And at this time, you're welcome to go back for sermon stories or sit with your families. Thank you so much. Please join me in a spirit of prayer, the prayer of reflection. Gracious God, open our ears and our hearts and our whole selves to attend to your words. Help us set aside fear, both if we follow your words too closely, what will happen? If we don't follow your words too closely, what will happen? Let us let go of all other fears. Let us love your words. Let us know your words. And by knowing, share your love. Amen. Uh, the first reading is Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 3, and then we jump to 1922. 
and this is found or starts on page 690 of your pew Bible. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. The sun will no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light by night. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, or your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light in your days of mourning will be ended. Your people shall all be righteous and they shall possess the land forever. They are the shoot that I planted, the work of my hands so that I might be glorified. The least of them shall become a clan and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord and it's time I will accomplish it quickly. The next reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can it be restored? It is good for nothing. It is thrown out and trampled into the ground. You are a light of the world, but a city on a hill cannot be hid. Who lights a lamp and puts a bushel basket over it? People light a lamp, put it on the lampstand so it will shine throughout the whole house. In this way, shine your light so that all the peoples will see the good deeds you do and give glory to your heavenly Father. Amen. I have to say that's the most enthusiastic reading I have ever heard of the Matthew passage. Thank you so very much for that. You brought that to life. Thank you also for this very warm welcome here to Lewinsville. Truly, what a wonderful congregation you are. I've enjoyed spending some time with you earlier this morning in class and to have the chance to worship with you together. Uh, what a gracious opportunity it is to recognize who we are as inheritors of a faith uh, not just in terms of the, re of the Reformed faith, but the Christian faith. And that, that has, faith has upheld us for 2,000 years and will uphold us for thousands more, should the Lord not come between now and then. But what a wonderful thing to consider on this day and every day, that we are on that stream together, that the path that we are taken is well trod. And it is a path that has seen fear and anxiety and and a lot of discord, and yet they believed. So as we come to faith in God, may we come together in prayer to hear God's word for us today as he takes us on our journey. Would you pray with me? Gracious and almighty God, thank you for taking us on this journey of faith and, and showing among us the saints who are upholding us, saints who are living among us in the cloud of witnesses that surround us, that we would be strengthened by their testimonies, straightened, straight, strengthened by the courage that they have cho shown in the face of so many things that seek to dispel the strength that we have in your Holy Spirit. So now speak to us in a way that we've never heard before, that we may, in the days that are to come, days we have not yet seen, we will be able to proclaim your glory and shine your light. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I like the Matthew passage. You might have heard it before. It's one of those passages that gets tossed around fairly frequently. Uh, you may not know, this is probably a, a Sunday school test for you, that it falls in, in a larger context. It is, in fact, the second point of a very Presbyterian sermon, very three-point sermon, and that is the Sermon on the Mount. You know the Sermon on the Mount more frequently as the Beatitudes. Lots of illustrations, how one is 
one promises that are given one to another, inspirational blessings that we have. It's a great way to start a sermon, draws them all right in. Then he comes up with this second one, uh, you know, and, and, and I'll talk about that in just a second, but the, the third point is the kicker, right? That's the one that kicks you out the door, the must-dos, no law, don't, you know, no, don't break the law, no murders, no adultery, divorce, oath, enemies, all sorts of expectations to live by, your typical third point of the sermon. But it's the second one I really like. It, it is, too, within itself an inspiration for daily life, but as good sermons should do, it offers illustrations that the congregation can relate to. In fact, in Jesus' congregations, there were great crowds following him, and he had this way of entering into their daily lives with illustrations that made sense to them. So here we have, in this second point, this idea of salt and light. And it made sense to them in ways perhaps are different that made than make sense to us today, but in fact, it was a it hit a, a chord for them, struck a chord for them that they would very that would resonate for them in their daily lives. So let's us give that some consideration. Now, many have preached on this metaphor. It falls into the lectionary occasionally. I have di diverted from the lectionary. I apologize for that. If you are all faithfully lectionary followers, but. I like to preach on this, this particular passage because in my world, I have run across a lot of evangelicals. As I've grown up in the, in, the, in the military chaplaincy where I served for 35 years and retired a couple years ago, and now in this, oh, let's call it a representative uh, congregation in which I serve, there are many, especially in Washington, D.C., who love to throw around salt and light rather liberally. I mean, casually. <laughs> What's interesting is as, as they talk about salt and light, it, it seems that they think that God is implying that to be salt, one has to try to live a certain way. You sort of become salt if you behave correctly. Sort of makes sense, right, given some of the injunctions that follow in the third point. They make it sound like you should become like the city on the hill, as if these are qualities or character traits that one learns or develops. At some point, if you're a good enough Christian, you will become salt. You will become like light. But Jesus says very specifically, you are salt. You are already salt. The things that you do from day to day are already preserving and enhancing the things around you. You could also add that given the nature of salt, that they also might be corroding or poisoning the things around you. You are salt. Consider the influence, for instance, of parents. You have clearly an influence on what is around you. Say one bad word and it never leaves you for the rest of your child's life. But there's a story of a family where they had a, a, a mom and a dad and a young boy and they were going to have company over that night. A, a fairly large group, probably a church group or something, right? And, and so. Dad said to his son, you know, I'd really like you to say grace tonight when our gathering is here, when our company is here. And the boy said, oh, well, uh, okay. But he was sort of mortified, kind of like you all are when somebody says, hey, could you say grace for us? That's why you lean on Scott. But in this case, the, the dad said, no, no, uh, son, you should say grace. Well, uh, okay, but what should I say? He says, don't you worry. You'll, it'll come to you, but think about just saying what mommy says. So there they were, gathered around the table. It was a lovely evening. Candles were lit. The food was in front of them. Great joy and fellowship at the table. And they all bow their heads reverently. And the son says, dear Lord, why in heck did I invite all these people over? <laughs> You see, you are already enhancing, flavoring, maybe even ruining 
the things that are around you. But let's look at this metaphor a little bit close, more closely. Especially in that day and age, salt was much more valuable than we give it credit for today. Yes, we know it as a flavor enhancer and a seasoning. It was also a preservative. Many of you have traveled to Austria, perhaps, and gone to Salzburg. You tracking? It, in fact, was a, a city where salt was mined and, and sold, and it became a, a thriving, a thriving trade center. You may have heard of the word salary. It comes from the word salarium, which means salt money. Oftentimes, people were paid for their labors in salt. Have you ever heard of the phrase, you are worth your salt? But salt also had a very sacrificial and sacramental value. Moses and the Israelites over their time would add salt to their offerings as if it would enhance the gifts that they were laying before the Lord. Later, the Israelites would use something called a covenant of salt, which culturally meant it ratified the friendship. It seasoned an alliance. It sealed their mutual fidelity and concern one with another. In 2 Chronicles 13, God actually makes a covenant of salt with the people when God gave the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants. Salt was a symbol, a visible symbol of an invisible promise that was sealed by God's love for his people. This covenant was established so that they would live in response to God's grace, that they would serve God in love. In faith, each month, we celebrate a new covenant sealed in Christ's blood. Ratified by the love God has given us in Christ, it isn't salt anymore, but it is the same and yet even more profound covenant that God wishes to establish with his people today. It is, in fact, a covenant that is ratified not by salt, but by sacrifice the sacrificial, sacrificial love God has shown us through Jesus Christ. It is a love so compelling that we are called to respond in kind, just as the Israelites, to live our lives as God has sacrificed himself to us with compassion and grace. So, my friends, you are salt already. And that salt is, in fact, a symbol of the covenant that God has made with us. God hopes that as we live our lives and what we say and what we do will be a taste of that covenant sealed in Christ's blood. But let me ask you, as we live our lives, not here necessarily in the sanctuary, but as we proceed from these doors out into the world, as we are called to do, what taste do we leave in the mouths of the people around us? Do we serve as a testimony or a witness to the covenant that God has made through us, through, in, with us through Christ? Do we influence the world with this incredible compassion and grace? Are we flavor enhancers? Is that the taste we leave behind? You are the salt of the earth. The same is true for the second metaphor. You don't become the light of the world. You already are. So let me tell you where I work. Oh, well, you know. Consider Washington, D.C. As you do, and even out here in, in McLean, you can probably catch a glimpse of that 288-foot hill on which there is a building with a very large dome, the Capitol. That, that 288 feet of earth and on top of that is a very tall, I mean, 88 feet above the Potomac, so sorry, the Capitol building is 288 feet tall, arguably one of the highest spots in the city. But if you look at that marvelous building, whenever you do approach it, and you see there is on top a 20-foot statue of freedom. And then there above that beautiful dome is a 50-foot temple-like structure 
with Corinthian columns. It has a name. This is your trivia question for the day. The name is called a tholos. Really pretty Greek kind of name. I'm thinking there's got to be something theological in there. No, actually, it, it, it means like a 50-foot temple-like structure with Corinthian columns. <laughs> but that kind of cake topper thing houses a six-foot wide lantern that is lighted when Congress is in session. It is meant to be able to be seen across the city. The fact that the light is illuminated when the nation's lawmakers are making laws that impact the entire country gives a whole new meaning to being a light on a hill. The impact of what's taking place in that iconic building has international ramifications. Think of that as we are told that we are the light on a hill. You, we, the congregation, people of faith, are a city on a hill. What's going on beneath our tholos? What decisions are being made? How are, we are, how are we considering the impact we have or can have on the rest of our community, on our family, on our world? When that light is lighted in our tholos, what does it reveal? So in the Old Testament, God promised to establish a new Jerusalem, a city on a hill. The readers, the audience understood that. But he does so because Isaiah proclaims that God will make them, the Israelites, a light to the nations. But the reason behind it is often lost. You are a city on a hill. Why? That God's salvation may reach to the end of the earth. There is a light on the city, on a hill, so that God's salvation may be known, shown, revealed to the ends of the earth. It isn't a matter of the tholos on the capital. It's the light that we have been called to bear. You are the light of the, of the world, a light to the nations. And as we celebrate on this Reformation Sunday, this is in fact the crux of the message that the reformers were trying to say. The light isn't stuck in the tholos. The light is meant to go forward and out. That what we read or preach or sing isn't supposed to be stuck here in the pews. We're supposed to be able to access it in a way that couldn't be accessed before Martin Luther knocked his little theses on the wall. That what we have been given relates to us in such a way, God's glory has been revealed to us in such a way that we understand it. And God has given us illustrations after illustration after illustration that we would know of the mighty fortress of our God and the salvation we have been given through Jesus Christ. This is the light on the hill that all would know of the salvation, sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. That from our pulpits, from our halls of power, from our homes and in our relationships, this is the light that we shine in the darkness, even in these turbulent days. Is that the light you shine? The reason I, why I like this second point on the Sermon of the Mount is that Jesus is trying to say way more than just go forth and be. The fact that he's pulled out such resonant illustrations to them and to us is to show that he's trying to convey so much more, so much more than a certain way of living or being nice to the person in the grocery store line or qualities or characters that set us above everyone else. We can't sprinkle enough of that kind of salt. There isn't enough of our own kind of light to share in these dark days. Jesus' point in his sermon wasn't us to inspire us to become salt and light, 
but to remind us that we already are. How we live and how we treat each other can be enhancing or corrosive. More importantly, as people of faith, how we live and treat each other, the salt that we share should represent the sacrificial, generous, generous and compassionate love of Christ. The light that we reflect is the same. It is the light of salvation to the nations. Is that what our light reveals? What taste do we leave behind? Amen.
friends of Jesus Christ, in gratitude for the word proclaimed and the word given to us, let us now affirm our faith as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed, which can be found in your bulletins. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God, mighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. And he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The flowers in our sanctuary on this Reformation Sunday are given to the glory of God by Betty and Roland McElroy in loving memory of Bill and Margaret Witherspoon. And we join with Betty and Roland in thanking God for Bill and Margaret and for the impact they had on their family, on the church, and on the world. Friends, at this time, we'd love to invite you to sign and fill out the red hand of greeting pad that should be on the inside edge of your pews. If you can sign that and send it down the row and back, that'll help you get to know the other folks that you're worshiping with on the pew this morning and will help us to stay in touch with you about things that are happening here at Lewinsville. And if you are not currently on the church's email distribution list, leave us your email address and we'll get you added to that. Friends, there are a whole lot of things happening uh, here at Lewinsville, and we continue to be deeply thankful to the congregation for your generosity towards the mission and the ministry of Lewinsville Presbyterian. It is your support and investment in the church that makes possible everything that is happening, from our educational ministry with people of all ages, to our pastoral care, to youth and young adult ministry, to worship, to mission and outreach efforts, to our refugee resettlement ministry, and more. All of that is made possible by your giving. And you can give online at lewinsville.org by clicking the blue Make a Gift button there, and you can even set it up to give regularly uh, that way. Your support makes a huge impact. Um, if you have not already filled out and turned in your pledge towards next year's mission and ministry um, here at Lewinsville in 2023. There should be pledge cards in the pews, and you can fill that out, leave it in the offering plate, leave it in the church office, or you can go online and click the Make a Pledge Commitment button um, and do it that way. Friends, with thankful and joyful hearts, let us now continue our worship of Almighty God with our morning offering.
may be seated. At this time, as we turn to God in prayer for ourselves and one another, I have a couple of prayer requests I would like to share with you. Um, Barbara Jacobs, a member of Lewinsville Presbyterian Church, her mother, Betty Stewart, had a burial service this past Thursday, so prayers for Barbara and her family at this time. And some of you may already know this, but past, our former associate pastor here at Lewinsville, Pastor Emily Berman Deandra, her father passed away this week. So prayers for Pastor Emily and all of the family as they come to terms with this loss. And also, Elaine Davis let us know her son, Gregory, had a feeding tube inserted this past week for nutrition due to consequences of having cancer. So prayers for Gregory this week. Friends, let us turn to God in prayer. In the beginning of time, O oh God, you created this world as one enormous and glorious mystery. As author and creator of all that we see and behold, we are basking in the beauty of this autumn season. The leaves and the cooler weather whisper to us your goodness and love. Gracious God, we are in a world that is in need of your healing. And we ask that your Holy Spirit stir us into movement to become vessels of your love for lonely and neglected people. Heighten our awareness as to the needs of those around us whether that be for a warm blanket, food from our cupboards, or the calm presence and open ear, ear we might lend. Loving God, where our hearts feel empty or unsettled with heartbreak or loss or hospitalization of a loved one, God, we ask that Jesus' peace, which passes all understanding, settle within our hearts and calm all anxiety. For you are our peace, O God. God, a peace that was redefined in the 16th century as a young Martin Luther was stirred by your spirit to challenge the church to see you differently. So in the spirit of reformation and renewal, we hold fast to the fact that you are forming and reforming us, urging us onward toward the power of love. And for this, we praise you as we also pray in the words your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we are preparing now to follow our Lord Jesus Christ out into the world, there are a number of things happening here in the life of Lewinsville Presbyterian over the next couple of weeks. I want to take just a few moments this morning to draw attention um, to some of those. This afternoon at 5 o'clock p.m., we will be having Boptoberfest here in the sanctuary with a reception following um, that. This is the next installment in our Holy Happy Hour series, and today's event will be featuring Sarah Berger, Evan Ayers, and Zach Gutierrez. That's today at 5 o'clock. This coming Wednesday evening, we're going to be having an inquirer's class for anyone who is interested in joining Lewinsville Presbyterian Church as a member. So if you are new to Lewinsville or if you've been here for a while and are at a point now where you would like to make a formal commitment to this congregation, we'd love to have you join us for this class. That's this coming Wednesday from 5 o'clock until 8 o'clock p.m. There'll be a supper involved in that, and you can speak with Pastor Lane or Pastor Jen or me about that. There's some information in your bulletin about the upcoming Good Samaritan Day this coming Saturday, November the 5th, focusing on Lewinsville retirement residents. We need folks to sign up for that through the website or using the link in the bulletin. You're also going to find info in the bulletin about the special All Saints Day services next Sunday, November the 6th, with a service in the morning with the Misa Criosia and then a contemplative All Saints service of remembrance in the sanctuary and in the cemetery um, next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. 
Also, next Sunday, November the 6th, we're starting the next module of adult education classes. Rachel Russell and Linton Brooks are going to be leading a class entitled The Difficult Words of Jesus, working with a book by New Testament scholar Dr. Amy Jill Levine, looking at some of the hard sayings of Jesus in the New Testament. I'm going to be leading a class in the cycle of what we're calling the 101 series of classes. This year's class is Spiritual Practices 101. We're going to be focusing on practices of prayer and other ways for us to develop our spiritual lives. Um, the following weekend, Saturday, November 12th, your Faith and Public Policy Committee is hosting a breakfast with uh, Kim Bobo, the Executive Director of the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy. James Foster can answer any questions that you might have about that. And then on the following Sunday, November the 13th, after worship on the November 13th, this is one of the formal announcements that we need to make for this. We're going to be having the annual meeting of the Lewinsville Retirement Residents here in the sanctuary following the worship service. And everyone who is a member of Lewinsville Presbyterian is a member of the corporation of LRR, the Lewinsville Retirement Residents, and you're invited to that meeting to learn more about that great uh, place that's having an impact on so many people. Um, lastly, on the back page of your bulletin, you'll see a page to submit names of persons you would recommend for offices here in at Lewinsville um, that you can place there as a box in the church office for you to submit those names. You can also do that um, online at lewinsville.org. A lot going on. Friends, let us now stand and sing together our final hymn on this Reformation Sunday, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. Let's sing together.
Friends, Christ was in the world reconciling itself to himself. Now Christ calls us into the world to participate in that reconciliation. How? With the salt and the life that God has called us to be, that we would proclaim the covenant that has been made and sealed in Christ's blood, that we would shine God's everlasting light in this darkness. Go, be the salt and light in Christ's world. Amen. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.